Hi, this is Dr. Corey Glenn, and I'm going to give you just a quick run through of the uh, software portion of this case that I'm about to demonstrate. This was a patient that four months ago we took out a very infected uh, lower uh, right first molar. And at the time it was abscessed, it was very close to the nerve, and so we didn't feel comfortable debriding the socket enough to uh, do a bone graft. So it was just allowed to heal um, in the normal manner, and thankfully it did heal very nicely. Uh, we've gotten it back at four months and taken the cone beam scan, and as you can see, the bone up here is very immature looking. At least it's not as dense as the surrounding cortical bone here. Um, but in my experience, that, that doesn't really indicate that it's not going to be good bone for implant placement. It just means it's not quite as mature and mineralized. Um, as you can see, the crest is all intact all the way around here, so no worries really for me placing this implant. Um, so the way this process works, you would um, open up the CT scan, you would map the patient's nerve if you're placing it in the lower, and then you would plan your implant position. I've already done that in this case. Um, this was uh, a case where I intended to do a 5 by 10 millimeter implant. Um, you'll notice that this looks a little smaller, and if we actually go to the list, you'll see that this is actually a 4.3 by 10. Because that bone is more immature, I'm just tricking the software, and, and the reason I'm doing that is I want to actually use a smaller drill than the normal drill for the 5 millimeter implants. Um, that way I can undersize my osteotomy and get a little better primary stability when I actually do the case. So I'm going to plan it and drill it as if it were a 4.3 by 10, but we actually plan on putting in a 5 by 10. And the only difference that I'll do is I'll make the 4.3 osteotomy and then I'll drop the 5 millimeter drill just in through the very top of the cortical bone uh, so that there's no pressure necrosis that could happen. So once you've planned your implant position, you need to import an STL model. Um, that's just a fancy word for a digital model. So if you look at this picture, you can see that we've got the green model imported. And if I turn off this 3D rendering, you can see that this is a very accurate model. Uh, it corresponds perfectly to what's actually in the patient's mouth. And we've got to marry that in with our CT data. And so as you can see, these are very closely meshed. And any time I do this, I always verify the accuracy of that stitch. There's two windows I would do that in, in this coronal view. As you come up through the teeth, when you scroll through, you ought to see that the outline of the green model very closely matches up with the tooth position. So as you see, I can scroll through here and the teeth disappear and reappear at the same time as the green model. The other one you would verify that in is the cross-sectional view. So when I scroll through this model, you can see that this green outline exactly matches up with the actual tooth position in the CT scan. So once we're confident that we have a good uh, stitch of our CT data and our STL model, at that point you can create a surgical guide on this STL model. Um, I'll spare you the details of that, uh, but this is the end result. We did get the uh, the Surgical guide design is a very quick process, and as you can see, the blue here is the guide. It's got the hole already in the correct position. It's got a ring here that will depth limit you to the proper depth for the implant placement. And so you would just have this 3D printed, and at that point you're ready to do your case. Okay, go ahead and suction out. So we're doing an implant on number 30 today. This is a tooth that we extracted. Um, it's been a few months back, but it had a severe infection at the time, and uh, since it was right on top of the nerve, we did not do a bone graft. So, at least on the cone beam, the bone looks really immature. I really expect it to be good quality, though, when we get in there. You'll notice I used a curved scalpel blade to do that initial incision. Otherwise, there's no way to get access coming in from this way with a 15 blade. Um, so just a little trick to help get access to make your initial incision. Doing okay? Not feel anything? Mm -mm. Okay. <coughs> Periostral. Okay. 
just a little tag there. And vice versa, the uh, curved blades are not getting not great at getting this little corner right here. So I just like to have both of them set up on the tray. Excellent. And like I anticipated, that looks like it's very good quality bone, even though the comb beam, uh, you might not think it looking at that. So no need for a really big flap, just big enough to expose the crest. Got our surgical guide here. Okay, I'm going to have you hold that with one hand and irrigate with the other. Okay, just keep it pressed really good. Now because I did anticipate that to be immature bone, I didn't use the, uh, I plan on putting in a 5x10 implant here, but because I anticipated it being pretty immature bone, I didn't use the full size drill. And the thinking on that was that we would use one size smaller, and that way if there was uh, you know, any problems with stability or anything, that we could just go ahead and compress the bone and get good primary stability. And so I don't want to go to the very bottom with this one, but I do want to profile just the very top here for a 5 millimeter implant. And so I just did that a little bit freehand. Good. Alright, can you get me an implant out? <coughs> We're going to be placing a Blue Sky Bow 5 by 10 And right now what I'm doing is adjusting the motor torque down, um, or first of all the RPMs down to about 45. And then I'm also going to turn the automatic torque control down to 30 newton centimeters. That's what I usually set it at because in general if you torque out and have 30 newton centimeters, then you can pretty much be safe with putting on a healing abutment. Now I really don't intend to. Um, but I still like to know that I had that initially. Alright, so here's our implant. Now a little something I do, you'll notice a little bit of stuff on the end here. This may or may not be necessary, but I usually coat the end with Neosporin. If you've ever had the experience on a lower implant of the implant falling off in the mouth or in the floor on the way to the mouth, it can ruin your day and be a costly mistake. So this actually creates a little surface tension inside of that where you don't have to worry about it. Okay, irrigate that out really well. Okay, we torqued out right there. 
and I'm not quite fully seated. So now I'm going to torque up or uh, turn the torque on the motor up just to get it fully seated. Here, get the top of that off. Just looking at my platform position right now, I want to get it maybe a half millimeter subcrestal. <laughs> this is a bit of an off label use for your handpiece. But I don't feel like going and getting the hand torque wrench. Alright, so I just want that with a flat side of the hex to the buckle. As you can see there we have that. We're just subcrestal. Now we could close up and normally you would do that, but I'm actually going to place something on this real quick. Uh, it's actually an impression transfer and we're going to do a little test on the stability with the uh, implant test which Blue Sky Bio sells and it's just a device that tests the integration or well I shouldn't say integration, it tests the stability and we'll be able to compare what we have today at the surgery to what we have at Uncovery in three months and the idea is you want to see that be going up So that's fully seated. Get a little quick shot of that, Mary. So this is the implant test, and it's got a little sensor here or a probe that will come out and tap that. Um, the only important thing is you need to hold this perfectly horizontal to keep it in balance. So what we'll do is just hold it a millimeter or two from the implant, horizontal, and then push the button. Okay, we didn't get a good reading there, so I need to reorient. Okay, 7.6 is what I'm getting. We'll do it one more time. 7.9, so very high initial stability on this implant. Really with a number like that, you could probably immediately load it. That's not how I roll. I like to limit my risk and the patient's risk, so I like to let everything heal up for three or four months with full primary closure. That's just given me the most predictable results. Very good, really well. And so this is the healing cap going on. Our cover screw. Having trouble with my terminology today. And I just put these on finger tight. All right, so a couple sutures and we'll be done.
And these are Cytoplast PTFE sutures available from Osteogenics. These are probably my favorite suture to use. Um, you'll notice there I threw the first knot. I'm not terribly concerned that it's completely seated because when you come back with this kind of a suture and you throw your second knot, it will actually cinch the first one down very nice. And you get a good snug fit down on the tissue. And then just throw a few more. And the other thing I love about these sutures is that the tissue just heals like they're not even there. I mean, they are really inert, very tissue friendly. They're worth the premium price. Okay. section. <gasps> All right. And let me trim up those tag ends. Scissor. Would you say that procedure was compared to like the extraction when you had that done? Me? Yeah. Easier, harder? Oh, that. The extraction was probably quicker. Quicker? Well, I mean, you just, yeah. you just had to hit it one time. <laughs> right. And it fell out. Right. It was great for me, but as far as pain, I didn't hear feel anything either time. Great. All right. You did a great job. As far as I'm concerned. A great patient to do it all. We appreciate it. <clears throat>